Welcome to day three of 365. Today we're discussing Shakespeare's Hamlet. Stay tuned. Soon, but we had to come through Abington on our way. And I'm like, oh God. Shakespeare's Hamlet, written around 1600 by the great bard, may have been one of the most studied pieces of literature in the Western world. It follows Prince Hamlet, who comes home to his father's death and his mother marrying his uncle, who assumes the throne. And then a series of things go down. Hamlet believes that his father who comes to him as a ghost in the opening scenes, has charged him with dealing with Claudius. When Claudius, in order to prevent Hamlet from revealing the truth about the king's death, tries to have him killed, the result is that all three, Gertrude, Claudius, and Hamlet involved, are poisoned, and the Danish throne is taken over by Fortinbra, the ruler of Norway. So that's kind of the quick thing. Much of modern criticism focuses on the character of young Hamlet and his ability or his inability to act decisively. But I think this is one of the reasons this makes this specific play one of the greatest. One of the things that um, we studied this past semester in my play script analysis class in grad school was Hamlet and that opening scene. Notice that he, Shakespeare hooks you um, this book, James Thomas, who writes about script analysis, talks a little bit about Shakespeare. And there's another book by a man with the last name Ball who talks a little bit about Hamlet in his book. And in both cases, they talk about the fact that Hamlet, um, Shakespeare keeps you on the edge of your seat, keeps you wanting more. And he does that so perfectly from the very opening. He's the master of exposition. Um... I prefer the Folger Shakespeare editions, but of course, whatever floats your boat. Uh, in the opening of Hamlet, the very first line is two words, and it sets up the rest of the act, essentially. So, you it's who's there. Bernardo goes, who's there? And they think it's the ghost that has appeared to them, and then these, these guards, then the ghost appears and doesn't speak. Then the ghost appears to Hamlet, who is now up on the ramparts and yet doesn't speak. Um, so it just keeps you engaged in the exposition. So by the end of this first scene, you know that the ghost is the father of Hamlet, the, uh, that he is asking Hamlet to avenge his death, and that... Um, the ghost has been a fleeting character and has appeared before now. So in the second big scene, uh, it, it gets back into some of the classic expositional tactics and playwriting, uh, things like uh, the announcements by Claudius and the arrivals of different members of the court. The next scene takes place in this big palace in the throne room, so to speak, and they're having a kind of a grand time. Um, why do I love Hamlet, and why do I constantly say that this is my favorite of Shakespeare's works? But this idea of Hamlet is not original to Shakespeare at all. In fact, it is based off a much older tale called Ur Hamlet, or Ur Amlet, uh, that goes a little differently. Hamlet has been widely thought to mark the beginning of the modern age, Yet, during Shakespeare's time, the plot was considered tired and outdated, depending on stock treatments of murder and revenge and devices as the appearance of a ghost. They thought, this is tired, this is dated. Um, it is Hamlet's inferiority and subjectivity that allow him to be categorized 
as a modern man. Since inwardness emerges on the literary scene as the defining trait of modern, right? So that's a, that's a literary thing. Inwardness emerges as kind of the, the modernistic trait of the, the modern man is the ability to look inward, and Hamlet does that. Uh, does Hamlet get what he wants in the play? I don't think Hamlet wants the throne. Maybe Hamlet wants the throne, really. I, I, I know what the script says, but does Hamlet get what he wants? Maybe so. Um, I will tell you that this is one of the hardest plays I've seen to play the lead role in. Uh, it's one of the greats. It's the King Lear's. It's the uh, Scottish play. So like I said, we've copied things, uh, but we haven't outdone this. Um, one of the most famous examples of copying is The Lion King, which is supposedly closely based to Hamlet. Um, there are some differences. Uh, a Nightmare on M Street alludes to Hamlet in connection with the protagonist, Nancy. So there are a lot of cultural references to Hamlet. I'm going to pull up a couple here in my notes. Um, in Star Wars, Chewbacca tries to uh, resemble the body of the robot C-3PO. At one point, he holds C-3PO's head in much the same way that Hamlet is traditionally depicted as holding Yorick's skull. This reference was intentional on the part of the director. So Hamlet appears throughout modern culture, and the list goes on. In fact, there is a Wikipedia page um, that I'll put the link to in the description that uh, specifically talks about all the modern references, cultural references, back to Hamlet, right? So I've been trying to put these reviews more into a box, and I'm going to attempt to do that a little bit. Let's talk about the themes um, obviously the main theme of this is revenge. He's avenging his father's death. So that is the central theme that drives the plot and drives the character development for Hamlet. Um, he is seeking revenge both for his father's murder and for his mother and his uncle's corruption. He's got to reveal it all. Um, second theme is going to be morality the consequences of inaction, and the moral dilemma faced by the characters, right? So, um, morality. It is a, a bit of a morality play in ways, not in the traditional form. There are things called morality plays. I know that. Uh, madness. Uh, we talked about how yesterday in Tennessee Williams' Glass Menagerie, Laura's madness was interpreted as fragility, Hamlet's is often not interpreted as fragility. In fact, it's interpreted more as turmoil in his life and a bad thing that needs to be dealt with. Um, appearance versus reality, another theme, a consistent theme. Uh, many situations throughout the play appear to be honest and forthright, but they're actually deceitful and dishonest, right? And so Shakespeare starts saying, hey, you know, you're on the other side of the fourth wall. You need to see this deceit and this dishonesty for yourself. Um, so, you know, it talks about madness. Everyone talks about the madness of Prince Hamlet. And it's so interesting how we compare that to characters like Laurel Wingfield in Tennessee Williams' The Glass Menagerie. But let's talk about production for a minute. That's something that's very important to me. So we've got themes. How do we produce this? Hamlet is a great show that can be produced with so little and so much. There's a very few basic props that you need to convey the story. Uh, some of them may be not so basic, but a few, right? So, you know, the big ones that I, would, I think would be weird would be finding, you know, all the royal stuff. Sometimes that can be hard to do. And maybe, like, the Yorick skull looking good. and But overall, and you've got to have stage combat weapons. But overall, pretty easily to produce. In fact, I think that props may be the hardest part. This can be done on a bare stage with just a couple of chairs that keep getting moved around to represent these other places. Uh, and I've seen it done. Everything from 
the um, the bear stage with a couple of chairs, black curtains, all the way up to the Kenneth Branagh film, which, um, I mean, it goes all the way there. If you want to see Hamlet on your, you know, like I just want to go watch a, uh, Hamlet, the, the last, I, I guess it would be the last film. Let me look. I think it would be... No, I mean, I'm sure there's been some remakes. This was from 1996. It's four hours long. Uh, but you really, if you want to see Hamlet in its entirety, pretty accurate to what we call Shakespeare's original script, which we really don't know that it is, but this is pretty close. Um, Hamlet with Kenneth Branagh as Hamlet does an amazing job at capturing this in a realistic way. Now, is Shakespeare unified Aristotelian wise? No. This does not take place in one day, in one rise and fall. It takes place over a, a good bit of time. There are skips in the timeline along this process. So there's a lot to say that no, it does not maintain the unities. Um, does it betray it in the sense that we've discussed in a Brechtian sense? Does it approach epic theater? No, it doesn't. It is very much the typical dramatic form of the day. And there are a lot of political, historical, socio reasons why it would be written that way. Shakespeare was not trying to challenge theatrical theory with this. So, Thank you for being here for our short review of Hamlet. If you haven't read Hamlet, it did take me a couple of days to read through this. So if you haven't read Hamlet, grab you a copy. Folger Shakespeare Library has what I consider the best references because it's laid out all beautiful. Like it's not, see, look at that. Isn't that wonderful? This is what you want to read. And it has resources, right? So Shakespeare's life is what you were looking at. But it also has an introduction to the text, modern perspectives, and a lot of information on further reading. In fact, I am surprised. I need to go do further reading. So thank you for sticking with me. Tomorrow we will be back in the Americas as we discuss a Pulitzer Prize winning play that I also recently fell in love with. I probably consider tomorrow's play one of my top five at the moment. Uh, the other day I actually said it was my top one, but it, those change daily. So uh, join me tomorrow for that. Have a great night and like, comment, and subscribe.